The Coker Trilogy is a series of three films by Iranian filmmaker Abbas Kiorostami. Where's the friend's house and life goes on through the olive trees. The three films are not bound by a similar theme or idea, but the common link is that all three stories are set in Coker, a small village in the Gilan province of Iran. Kiorostami did not like the classification since the three films were never intended or designed as a trilogy. Instead, something that the critics formulated. Let's have a look at the three films in some detail. To me, this film is the best of the lot. It's a simple, beautiful story of friendship. A school kid, Ahmad, by mistake takes home a notebook of his classmate, Muhammad Riza, who the same day got a scolding for not doing his homework and a warning that he'll be expelled if he does it again. Realizing this, Ahmed decides to return the notebook, but the problem is that he doesn't know his friend's exact address. Of course, before that he has to get out of his house, which his mother won't allow. After a while, when his mother asks him to get some bread, Ahmed sets out with the notebook. The film follows Ahmed in his quest to find his friend before it's too late, presenting a world that is apathetic and somewhat unfriendly. There's a complete lack of communication between Ahmad and the adults. Ahmad is ignored by his mother, who's constantly delivering instructions, and by his grandfather, who reckons that children should be beaten every fortnight to teach them values and turn them into useful members of society. People on the streets, when asked for information, provide no help either. It's Ahmad's persistence that keeps him going. As writer Alberto Elena states on the film, Ahmed's disobedience should not be seen as a simple and trivial escapade in search of his friend's house, but as a genuine rejection of the suffocating rules of a patriarchal system governed by the weight of tradition. The statement sounds impressive, but there's another element worth discussing. The character of the old carpenter is a perfect foil to Ahmed. He keeps talking about the beauty and durability of the woodwork he did years back for countless households and how they are being replaced by allegedly stronger iron doors and windows. The film creates an interesting dichotomy, a traditionalist old man helping out a modernist Ahmad. The old carpenter accompanies Ahmad to the place he thinks is what the kid is looking for. But it too does not bring peace to Ahmad's anxious mind, as it turns out to be the wrong house. Parting with the old man, Ahmad, though unsuccessful, manages to return home safely. Kurostami omits Ahmad's difficult journey back home and his encounter with the presumably angry, agitated family members and cuts instead to the aftermath of the scolding and presumable beating. It's a dramatic device that works really well. In the house, we see a teary-eyed Ahmad who does not want to eat. He goes back to his room and starts doing his homework when the storm outside pushes open the door with a terrific thud. A calm, Assured Ahmad is not mindful of it. He's gone through an exhausting adventure in a single day. A late night return through darkly lit alleys, creaking windows and barking dogs. Ahmad has seen worse. The next morning, in the nick of time, he manages to give back the notebook with homework to a novice Mohammad Riza. The teacher approves of the work, thereby saving Ahmad's friend from certain expulsion. On the same page, lies the flower that was given to Ahmad by the old gentleman. After the 1993 earthquake in Iran, a filmmaker along with his son visit Coker in search of the two kids who played friends in the first film to check if they are doing all right. Interestingly, Kyorostami's own journey to Coker with his son three days after the earthquake led to this film. The on-screen filmmaker never tracks the kids down, but he witnesses in the process the efforts of people trying to rebuild their lives in spite of unimaginable suffering and loss. The villagers have gone back to some of their routines, washing the dishes, cleaning a rug and watering the plants. There's a couple who got married a day after the earthquake and some football enthusiasts who are preparing to watch the World Cup. As the guy who's seen setting up the TV antenna states, 
والا خب عزادار که خودم خواهر کوچه که خودم از دست دادم صدا خواهر بچه‌م از دست دادم والا خب چه کار کنیم هر چهار سال یه بار فوتبال اونم به هر حال باید زندگی دیگه من The filmmaker son Puya in his childishness has accepted the instability of the earthquake and his focus is on the joys of life In a beautiful scene he tells a mother who's lost her daughter how the girl would never have to do homework and how her younger brothers who are safe and doing fine shall now appreciate life more Later he convinces his dad to watch football with others Kids live in the present and Puya too has moved on from the disaster in stark contrast to his father who keeps dwelling on the earthquake and its impact asking people about their traumas and sufferings Kyorostami pleads us not to demonize nature for this disaster by employing long POV shots of landscapes and by aesthetically framing dilapidated ruined buildings the chaos of long traffic jams among other things the director presents a dichotomy finding beauty in these tough times of sadness and negativity Film critic Yusuf Ishakpur has underlined this quite well. The disaster caused by the earthquake, which in the eyes of a modernist should in itself have incited a rebellion against nature, is instead transformed into the promise and possibility of reconciliation. The runtime at 90 odd minutes is all right, but honestly, the film does become a bit boring at some places. Another thing that seems a bit odd to me is the fact that the only piece of music Kyorostami utilizes in this film is this western classical piece concerto for two horns and strings by Vivaldi maybe Iran's folk or classical music would have been more appropriate however as i researched more on this i found that the decision was a subtle jibe at iranian authorities of the time who firmly rejected cultural cross breeding of ideas the last scene has the filmmaker heading up in his car on a steep zigzag road familiar he fails the first time and gets a push from a man carrying a cylinder up the hill the same guy who the filmmaker ignored just minutes back when he asked for a lift the filmmaker was so determined to catch the two boys he paid no attention the second time though the car makes it and we see the filmmaker stopping by the man to take him to his destination this 3 minute sequence is presented in a wide angle static long shot it's an open ending we don't know whether the protagonist will ever find the two boys will he maybe that was never the question the question was can we support and assist each other during tough times خونه داره با خونه داره ازدواج کنم پول داره با پول داره بی سواد با بی سواد یه زندگی نمیشه This film tells the story of the actors who played the couple in the second film and life goes on. An impoverished, illiterate and unemployed building worker, Hussein is in love with a high school girl Tahira, who belongs to a decent, well-to-do family. With a marriage proposal, Hussein first goes to the girl's mother and later when the earthquake kills Tahira's parents to her grandmother. But his proposal is rejected both times. He has to have his own house first. In a conversation with the director of the film, Hussein proposes an idea to wipe out social injustice. The culture should marry the illiterate, the rich should marry the poor, people with houses should marry those with none in order to help each other. Well, wouldn't this be an ideal society? In the little breaks during the filming of the sequence in the stairs, Hussein tries to convince Tahira of his love and his noble intentions. In several positive reviews about the film, they say that it's a love story. and portray Hussein as being determined with a never give up attitude however to be honest i find his persistence annoying maybe it's due to a cultural gap but hussein comes across as a stalker tahira constantly ignores him but he keeps chirping on it's really painful to watch since we never hear a single word from the girl the two times she properly expresses herself is at the beginning of the film in both cases without Hussein's presence when filming ends Hussein makes his final attempt and follows her as she walks home insisting on being given an answer the same zigzag path that Ahmed took in the first film leads them to an olive grove here like the end of the second film a wide angle long shot tracks Hussein pursuing Tahira until 
she seems to stop and turn after the two part ways hussein seemingly jumps around suggesting that she gave him a positive answer the musical score too hints at the girl's sudden change of heart in an interview kyorostami mentioned it's a tale of social injustice frustration forbiddance and stifling tradition hussein manages to break class barriers and social laws of a stagnant era due to his determination i'm really not sure if this idea of breaking class barriers comes across in this pretentious film hey guys thanks for watching what are your views on these three films let me know in the comments be sure to subscribe if you enjoy the channel cheers